Well, the past few Sundays we've been talking about what, what, uh, why God has allowed suffering and pain in the world or why there's evil in the world. We saw that this past few Sundays. So we know right away that our God is all powerful. We know that He knows what He's doing. He has plans before the foundation of the world. And if you recall, I did talk about, I made quite a few references to uh, before the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. So today, today what we want to do is, I want, to, I want us to take a little bit of a peek into the world, into, in, into the time before creation, to see what was happening the time before creation. So if you have your pens and, 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 and notepads, please, write this down this is going to be the outline for today's uh, today's sermon so we have the introduction as usual and then we are going to look uh, point number one charity the charity or love love point number two the conferee the conferee or the recipient of this love so we have the charity we have the conferee the recipient the one who receives who receives god's love love Point number three, the cost. The cost. Point number four, uh, the covenant or the promise. The covenant. And then point and then the last one will be our conclusion, right? So this are the this are this are the this is the outline that we are gonna use. So let me go over over it again. Charity, you know, the, the, the love of God which we saw on Mother's Day, first Corinthians chapter thirteen. The conferee or the recipient of God's love, which is Ephesians 1, 3 to 5. Please write it down. Ephesians 1, 3 to 5, 3 to 5. The cost. The cost. We're going to look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. And then we're going to look at the covenant or the promise, which is which is which which will be found in Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Shall please pray. Shall please pray. Shall please pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are grateful for who you are and for what you've been doing in our lives. We thank you, mighty God, that we can call upon you anytime and know that you will hear us and you will answer. As we begin this journey again, Lord God, we open our hearts and we open our minds. We know, Lord, Lord God, we surrender all to you. Say, please have your way in our lives. The challenges that we have, the difficulties that we are having in our lives, sometimes the loneliness, sometimes the pain in the body, whatever it is, we bring all to you. Challenges in our relationships, oh God. Sometimes with our husbands, with our wives, with our children, with our parents, with our, you know, with, with so many challenges. But Lord God, we are, we've come to you this morning to be rejuvenated, to be strengthened, to be encouraged my God, so that we can face the world and represent you in all things that we do, that your name will be glorified. We thank you, we glorify you, praise you in no other name, but in Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving in our hearts. Amen. Amen. So, you know, uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 starts with the beginning. Everything, all things have a beginning. Uh, did I say everything has a beginning? Uh, you know, what? let me let me admit that there was a beginning to everything, except that Genesis chapter one verse one says that in the beginning, God. So when Genesis one says in the beginning, God, it, that says God apart. It says God apart because what it is saying is that before there was time or space or matter, God was there. God was there before anything, before all things. Genesis 1 verse 1 also tells us that because God caused, you know, tells us that God caused everything. God was, God, so we say God is the primary cause. God is the first cause, you know. So now we know a, a little bit about the time that preceded all of creation. And knowing that we are curious creatures, God has woven in his word, the Bible, some information that helps us understand who he is and what his plan for us is. Now, we can see the information that I'm referring to in at least four places in the Bible. You know, where the scriptures uses a very familiar phrase, before the foundation of the world. 
before the foundation of the world. We see scripture use these phrases quite a few times. Now, the first instance of this phrase before the foundation of the world was given by Jesus himself in John chapter 17, verse 24, where Jesus, where Jesus said, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you love me before the foundation of the world. You see what Jesus Christ said? Jesus Christ said, John 17, 24. John 17, 24, I'm going to read again. Jesus said, Father, I desire that they also, those that you have given to me, be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. Look at it. He says what? For you loved me before the foundation of the world. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. So Jesus is speaking of love and his desire, you know, that all believers, you and me, be with him wherever he is. In other words, even if, it's in, if, even if, 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 even if he's going through pain and suffering and tough times, he wants us to be with him. But most importantly, when Jesus prayed his prayer, what he was talking about really is that, uh, you know, he's, he, he's saying that he wants us to be found with, to be with him throughout eternity in his father's house, which is heaven. You see that? Isn't that beautiful? Jesus wants us to be with him wherever he is. And now, this phrase was also spoken by Jesus' apostle, Paul, who wrote in Ephesians 1 verse 4. Ephesians 1 verse 4, look at what, look at what Paul, uh, Paul wrote. Paul wrote, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that, what? that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So again, we see that, that word charity, love. Again, look, Ephesians 1 4, it says again, I'm going to read it again. It says, according as he has given, uh, as he has chosen us, in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So we see right away that before the foundation of the world, when there was love, when God, when Jesus Christ said there was love between him and the Father, at the same time there was love for us, even though we were not created. Even though, even though we have not been created. So as you can see, it is again in reference to the love of God. Paul was writing about, about the love of God. Now, the next passage I want us to look at, the next passage I want us to look at is 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, and it says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, you know, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in this last time for you. So again, Peter is saying the same thing that Paul wrote. It's, Peter is saying the same thing that Jesus Christ said, that before the foundation of the world, there was love and God had foreordained these things and God had you in mind, God had me in mind, even though we had not been created at the time. And then the last passage I want us to look at, the last passage that we're going to look at is found in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. Revelation 13, verse 8 uses this phrase before the foundation of the world, but it uses it in a manner or in a way that reminds and warns us to ensure that we have our names written down in glory. Now, referring to those who worship the Antichrist, during the tribulation, Revelation 13 verse 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. You know, talking about him, talking about the Antichrist. Okay, so it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So that we know that Jesus Christ was slain before 
before the creation of the world. So it says the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. But the question is, do you have your name written down in the land, in the book of life of the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world? Do you have your name written down in the Lamb's book of life? Now, how do you get your name written down in the book of the life of in the, in the book of life of the Lamb of that was slain from the foundation of the world? How do you get your name written down in that book? It's simple. You do so by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Nothing else, not your works, not how good you are, not your riches, nothing but accepting Jesus Christ as what? As the Savior, as your Lord and, and, and Savior of the world. And, and you know, when we look at it, what else do we see? It tells us, it, 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 the question I'm going to ask is, does it tell us anything about God's plan before creation existed? Yes. Before the foundation of the world tells us something about what, what God had in mind. See, when Jesus first referred to before the foundation of the world in John 17, 24, it was all about love. It was all about love. We saw that as we read it, right? It's, it, it was all about love. So we know that before time, we know that before time, before all that we know today, before the creation of matter, you know, before the creation of angels, before the creation of humanity, there was love. There was love. Love existed. How do I know this? How do we know this? Look what the Bible says. Now, and I want you to watch this carefully. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And what is key in this verse is God. It says, in the beginning, God created the, the heaven and the earth. Now, this, the, the term of the name God that is used in Genesis 1 verse 1 is, is Elohim. Right? Elohim, you know, or, 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 or as others say, Elohim. And Elohim is a general name or term for deity, you know. And it's also a name for the one true God. For the one true God. This name, this name that we're talking about, this name that we're talking about right here, uh, Elohim. This word Elohim is the plural. It's the plural form of the word Eloah. And it's also one of the most frequently used names for God in the Bible. Now, what is important, you know, importantly, really, when it is shortened to L, E L L. It portrays and shows God's personal character. Elohim is plural. El is singular in that it portrays the personal what well, character of God. So, so, so for example, we have we have you know we have El Shaddai. El Shaddai means what well, the all sufficient God. We have El Sadiq, which means what well, the righteous God. We have El Emet, and El Emet means what well, the God of truth. We have El Hanakin and El Hanan is the faithful God. You see the thing? We have El Echad, which is the one God. We have what? El Elyon, El Elyon, which is the most high God. We have El Olam, the everlasting God. We have El Roy, which is the God who sees. I mean, there's so many El, 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 El in the Bible. El Roy is the God who sees. So, what, by the way, when a you know, when it says El Ron, the God who sees, God sees your situation. God knows your situation. God knows what you're going through right now. El Roy, God who sees. So we see the personal character of God when, when the Bible uses only El. El Roy. El Ola. El Sadah. The God who's sufficient. You see the thing? But in Genesis 1 verse 1, it uses Elohim. It uses Elohim. And the interesting aspect I want us to notice is that it is, in fact, a plural. I'm saying it again. It is a plural, which I believe is a clear reference to the Trinity. It is the divine plural, you know, the royal we. So we read in Genesis 1.26. We all know that verse. Genesis 1.26 says, And God said, let 
us. Make man in our image and after our likeness. So we see Elohim, rather we see the plural. It's not El. Elohim is what it's used. I'm talking about love. So, so, so bear with me, I'm talking about love. And I'm making a connection right here. I'm making a connection right here. Elohim is plural, and he says, let us make man, Genesis 126, let us make man in our image and, our, and after our likeness. And so this is the first clear indication of the triunity of God. See that? So why am I saying all this? Because before the foundation of the world and in the beginning, it, 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 God, there was love. God's plan has always been about love. There was, you know, it was all about love. Love within and between the triune God, the Trinity, the Godhead, and also God's love for you and for me. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Elohim, it says in the beginning, you know, let us make man in our image. And in the beginning, before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ in John 17, 24 said, well, well, Father, let them know the love that we have for each other in the beginning. What I was with you. So the, you know, so the Elohim was love and there was love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, talking about love, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and 16 says, God is love. You see that? God is love. And if you recall, if you recall about two or three Sundays ago on Mother's Day, we looked at agape, love, in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you recall, and where we saw the Bible's description of love. You recall that? You recall that on Mother's Day, we talked about it. We said that charity or love is, or, you know, God. God suffereth long. God is long suffering. He's patient. God is kind. Our love is kind. So, you know, we can interchange the word charity or love with God. So I, I, I can say charity envy of not all God does not envy. All love does not envy. Charity vaunteth not itself. Charity is not puffed up. You know, uh, love does not behave itself unsimply. Love does not seek its own. Love is not easily provoked. Love does not think evil. God rejoice. God does not rejoice in iniquity. God does not, re uh, you know, uh, if God doesn't rejoice in iniquity, then God rejoices in the truth. It goes on to say, charity, all love, all God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then verse 8 says, charity never faileth, all God does not fail you, love will not fail you, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall see, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So we see right away, First Corinthians 13 is talking about love, Jesus, he's talking about God, charity, you see that? So, 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 so before the foundation of the world, love existed between, you know, among the, 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 the triune God. And then the triune God also had love for you even before we were created. That's what the Bible is saying here, right here. So that's God before the beginning. That's God right there. First Corinthians 13. So while this love existed within and between the Godhead, by its very own nature, this love, charity, was also thinking of another. What do I mean? Elohim had others in mind. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had others in mind. Selfishness was far, far away from Elohim. Elohim was, or God was considering others. Elohim, our love, was considering others that Elohim had not yet even created yet. See, God had his mind on others that he hadn't even created yet. And more than that, more than that, Elohim knew what was going to happen and that he would be willing to bear all things and endure all things. Isn't that beautiful? God knew what was going to happen and he was, as 1 Corinthians 13 says, God was still willing to what? To endure all things, to bear all things. So what do I mean? First, let me simply draw your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7. And, and please write it down. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7. It says, 
we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed what before the ages for our glory. So God has revealed a few things that was hidden before what before the ages for our glory. So first Corinthians 2 verse 7, I'm gonna read it again. First Corinthians 2 verse 7 says, Paul, and that's Paul writing. Paul is saying. We're imparting a secret and hidden. We're revealing a secret and something that was hidden before. The wisdom of God. We're imparting it to you. So we'll know. So you'll know what God had decreed before the ages for our birth. And that's what we know. That's how we know that before, before the ages began, God loved us. See that? First Corinthians 2, verse 7. I mean, God has been loving us all the time. So what is the secret that Paul is alluding to here? To understand and to know what secret that Paul is talking to, that has been revealed to us. Let us go to Ephesians 1 verses 3 and 5. And that's bullet number 2. Conferee or the recipient of the love. So we've seen what? We've seen charity, which is the love. And now we're looking at the conferee or the recipient of the love. So Ephesians 1, 3 to 5. Ephesians 1, 3 to 5 says what? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And then look at it. Verse 3 says what? He says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. And then verse 5 says what? He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to what well, the good pleasure of His will. So look at it. So now Paul is showing, Paul is, is, is revealing to us something that was hidden before the foundation of the world, but now God has chosen His in His wisdom to reveal to us that what well, that uh, 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 that God blessed us even before, even before, and He chose us before the foundation of the world. So as you can see, we human beings, we are the recipients. We are the conferee of God's will and God's love before the creation of the world. You know, because I'm looking at what it says. It says, what, uh, the in love, he predestined us what, to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ, all according to the good pleasure of his will. I love that I feel safe, I feel protected, I feel sufficient, I feel full, I'm very confident. Why? Because I know that God had me in mind before the foundation of the world. And you should, you should too, if you're a believer. You should feel confident. You should, I mean, you should walk with a bounce in your steps, knowing that you are precious. So you see how precious we are as human beings? I mean, look at what we just saw. Uh, uh, Genesis 1 26, it says, What? God created us in His own image. You see that? So, Ephesians 1 3 to 5 that we just read is just astounding. It's just awesome. I mean, think about it. Just think about it. Sure, you know, one can understand that love will exist between the Father. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit way, way before the foundation of the earth. But Ephesians 1, 3 to 5 is informing you and I that God was also thinking way back then. He was thinking of all those that will be his even before he created, he created all of us. Even before he created, you know, Adam and Eve. God knew. God knew. God knew, I mean, that's just wonderful. It blows the mind away. Because you look at yourself, it's, uh, I mean, look at me, so small, a, a tiny a, a tiny individual in, in, in the world of, 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 of over 7 billion people, and God knows me by name, and God knows every hair on my head, and God knows every single drop of blood in my body, God knows every fiber in my being, and God calls me by name because he calls the stars by name. So look how important we are. We are created in his image. You see that? And so, you know, don't let, I mean, don't let all this humanist, you know, humanism and thinking, uh, uh, this, you know, this uh, 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 
Eastern philosophies and all kinds of things. Don't let that shake you. Know that you are special. Know that you are you, you are a preference. Know that you are a king and queen in God's house, in God's presence, because we are royalty. It may not look like that, but you are royalty. It may not appear so, but you are royalty. Because why? Because God made uh, every single man, every single human being in his own image. It's, it's very sad that today, you know, there are those who, who there are those who are not what uh, who don't appreciate who they are. It's, it's, it's so sad that there's racism in the world. But you know, God knew all of that before the foundation of the world. God knew. God knew. But He made us in His image. He made us in, in, in his image. And by the way, by the way, when the Bible says that we are created in God's image, you know what? It is really e e easy to understand what it means. What does it mean? It means man is a living being who is capable of embodying God's communicable attributes. And, uh, you know, and, and, and in our rational life, we are like God in that we can reason and we have intellect. See that we have, we can reason, we, we have will, we have emotions. When it says, when it says, we, when it says we're creating God's image in the moral sense, it, it, it means man was like God because man was good and sinless until sin entered the world. See that? So that's what it means by we are creating God's image. We have the capacity to, you know, to think, to reason, have emotion. Morally, before sin entered the garden, we were what? We, God, we were sinless and good. And good. So looking back now at Ephesians 1, 3, Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 5. He says what? God, before the foundation of the world, was thinking in love towards you, towards me, towards all mankind. He was, God was thinking of love towards all mankind. And so we see how precious we are to God. You know, like I said, probably you are wondering why he was thinking about you, about me, about us in love, when he knew Adam and Eve were going to sin. You know? Probably wonder why, but as we saw the past few weeks, and what we can see right here, Ephesians 1 35, right before the foundation of the world, God was looking at a time. He was looking forward to the time when there will be what? Several in his family. He was looking at a time when you and I will be part of his family. Isn't that beautiful? Praise the Lord for that. Praise him for that. He was looking for that. He was looking to make us a part of his family. Not just that. Not just that. But he's going to be with his family for eternity. He's going to be with us for eternity. But those who turn their backs on him, those who reject him, you know, they're going to be in hell, everlasting hell. That's what the Bible says. Eternally separated from God. And look, whether, you know, whether people choose to believe it or not, hell is real. Hell is coming sometime. If there's heaven, there's hell, right? And so God chose us. God prepared us before the foundation of the world. God had love for us even before he created us. He had love for us. That's why he created us in the first place. So we are all what? recipients of God's love. We are all the conferees of his love. We are the object of his love. Now, the other passage that I want, I want us to look at, 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Turn with me, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 18 to 20. And it talks about the cost that was attached to what God had for us before the foundation of the, of the world. It, it talks about the cost, what will be involved way before the foundation of the world. Look at what it says. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. It says, for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things. In other words, you know that you know we're not, we're, uh, you were not saved uh, through uh, the, uh, the, uh, gold 
and silver. You see the thing? So as, as much as you know that you were not saved by silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your, from, uh, from your fathers, but you have. But how were we saved? We were saved with the precious, verse 19 of First Peter, uh, 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 but we were saved with the precious blood of Christ. And then look at, look at what Peter wrote. As of a lamb without blemish and spot. Who, verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation, there it goes again, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in this last time for you. So we know right away that before the foundation of the world, God had also planned that somebody will somebody will, will purchase our sin with his precious blood. And that somebody was Jesus the Christ. What I just read, do you understand what I just read? First Peter, First Peter, First Peter, do you understand what I just read? First Peter 1, 18 to 20. Look at it again. It says, for as much, for as much as you know that you were not bought, saved, redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, just like a lamb without blemish and without spot who was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was made was revealed in this last time for you see what it means it says as believers you and i as believers and you and i believers and jesus christ were chosen before the foundation of the world so what does it mean what it what this passage is saying is that the trinity the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit chose us, chose you, chose me, if you're born again, by the way, chose you and chose me before the foundation of the world to be His. He chose us to be holy and blameless in His sight. Now, how, was, how, how are you going to be blameless? How am I going to be holy when I'm full of sin? When you are full of sin, how are we going to be blameless? But you see, what he's saying is that before the foundation of the world, God chose what, uh, uh, the only way that we can be blameless, pure, holy in his sight is if we accept Jesus Christ as our personal sin. That is why it says, but we are saved with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was for day, for, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for you. See the thing? So that is how we become holy and blameless when we give our lives to Christ. It's only through Christ. He was chosen to be the one. Who will make us holy and blameless? Let me, let me say that again. Let me say that again. Before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ was the one chosen to be the one who would what? Make us holy and blameless in God's sight. So, before the foundation of the world, Jesus, Jesus Christ, the same Jesus Christ that was crucified before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ in perfect, pure love was willing to be the Lamb of God that will offer himself so that you and I can be blameless and holy, so that you and I can be set free from sin and everlasting death. That is why Revelation 13 verse 8 says, He's the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. You see how it all comes together? Do you see how it all comes together? So here we see charity or love and the cost that is conferred on us, the recipients. So the triune God planned and agreed before those space, time or matter to show love. Now, so we've seen charity. We've seen the conferee. We've seen the cost. Now I want us to look at the covenant or the promise. The covenant or the promise. And, 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 to, and, and to look at that, please turn with me to to Titus, Titus chapter 1, the promise, the covenant. Turn with me to Titus, Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Before time began, there was a covenant 
in the, in the eternal councils of the triune God. Let me tell it again. Let me tell it again. Before time began, there you know uh, there was a covenant in, in, in the eternal councils of the triune God. What do I mean? What was the covenant? Look at what the Bible says. Titus one verse one to three. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of, of the truth which is after godliness. Verse 2 says, verse two, look at it, reading more of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You see that? So before, before the foundation of the world, there was a covenant, there was a promise. Let me, let me read it again. Let me read it again. Titus 1, 1 to 3. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of, of Jesus Christ, According to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in verse 2, in hope, watch this, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. See that? God cannot lie. And when God made a promise before the world began, God is going to keep his promise. I'm going to look at Look at what's happening in the world from the time from creation. When you look at the Bible, all the prophecies have been fulfilled one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. And there's some more in the future. And so God who cannot lie, when he makes a promise, he's going to come through with it. So first it says that God that cannot lie. And then it adds, then it adds God promised before the world began. So a promise or a covenant was made before time began. Before Adam and Eve were created, God had already made his covenant, his promise, as to what he was going to do. This covenant was before there was anyone around, of course, except God. The triune God, God the Father, made a promise to God the Son, and it involved hope of eternal life. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. God the Father made a promise to God the Son, and this promise or this covenant involved hope of eternal life. Whose who's eternal life? Yours and mine. Yours and mine. Yours and mine. So the promise, the covenant was that if the Son will become the Lamb of God, the Father will grant eternal life to any all who will put their trust in Him. I'm going to say that again. You know I'm going to say that again. And what I'm saying is that the promise that God the Father made to God the Son was that if the Son will become the Lamb that was to be slain, then the Father will grant eternal life to any, anybody, everybody, all who will put their trust in Christ. That's why Christ came and died on the cross. That's why we have Easter. You see that? And God, who cannot lie, made this promise before time began. Before there was space, time, and matter. Before the world was created, God made this promise to his son, Jesus Christ. And if God made that promise to his son, then, you, then for sure, you can take it all the way to the bank and know that you and I too will, will be saved if you give our lives to Christ. It's just so beautiful. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. And lest, lest we be remixed, right? Lest, lest we miss something. Look at, look at, look, look at something in Titus, Titus 1 verse 3. Look at what it says. Verse 3 now. Titus 1 verse 3. It says that God has in due times manifested or revealed his word through preaching. Which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. God our Savior. You see that? You see that? So going back to Elohim. We're going back to Elohim. The triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And I said, well, the, 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 the Elohim is plural. Here, here in Titus 1 verse 3, he calls God the Savior. We, know, we all know Jesus Christ is the Savior. But right here, God himself is being called the Savior. Who is the Savior? God our Savior. God our Savior. So do you see the covenant that we're talking about? Look, look, look at what the Bible says. Psalm 33 verse 11. 
Psalm 33, 11 says, and you know, Psalm 33, 11 is a short verse. It's an amazing verse because it says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm going to quote it again. I'm, I, I'm going to quote it again. Should I, should I quote it again? It says what? It says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The counsel of the tri of the triune God, the counsel of the Elohim, stands forever. The plans of His heart from generation to generation. See that? The counsel, the counsel of the Elohim, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, it stands forever. So God's plan, and I'm ending now. God's plan has been fulfilled up until now. I mean, you know, I just, I just love it. I just love the word of God because, look, this is where you get the truth from. This is where you get the truth from. Not somebody say, I, I have a vision, I had a vision, I had a dream. No, no, you get the truth right here from the word of God. You can't go outside of this book. You can't go outside of this book for the truth. You cannot go outside of this book for the truth. You want the truth? It's all right here. It's all right here. It's all right here. See, so God's plan has been fulfilled up until now. We've seen that before time and before the creation of the world. Charity existed between the Father and the Son. And then through a covenant, the promise was conferred to us. That is, anyone who will believe. But at the same time, the promise Involve cost. So we see the authority. We see the comfort, you and I. We see the covenant. We also see the cost. I'm ending now. We were in God's thoughts. We were chosen to be holy and blended before Him, as we see in our passages. God's plan. And God's plan, which is still unfolding, shows that what well, life isn't meaningless. God's plan, which is still unfolding, shows that life is not random, as people teach or preach. God's plan is about your life and my life. Now, Tori, love. God is available. His love is also available. But the end is fast approaching. And we all need to accept the offer of his love before it is too late. So the question is, will you? The question is, will you? Will you accept God's love with his, with his offering to us? Will you? How do, you, how, do you, how do you accept God's love? Very simple. Very simple. This, this, this is how we do it. It, and it's, it has to be from your bottom of your heart. Because the Bible says, with the mouth, confession is made. But with your heart, belief is made unto salvation. So this is what we do. I was, I'm going to say a short prayer. And you can follow me with that, all right? So he says, so here's a prayer. If you're not born again, Heavenly Father, be merciful to me, a sinner. I want to be a part of your family. I want to experience this charity. I want to be one of those on whom this charity is conferred. I believe in the covenant that, that existed between the triune God and which has been conferred also to me. I know it came at a cost that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Please accept me as, your, uh, 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 as one of your children. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.